Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Your first homework assignment was just posted, and it's it's two problems that are sort of probability review, and then a couple of problems. It's it's all really basic. Like after today's lecture, you will have all the knowledge you need. Uh, usually, um, a homework that's due on any given Wednesday covers the lectures from the week before, but this will we'll even be doing stuff on Friday that's not on this homework. So pretty basic, just to get our feet wet. Um, any questions on anything before we get started? Um, the Canvas page currently says I'm only dropping one assignment. That's not true. I'm dropping two and then maybe another one. Uh, and I was trying to fix it this morning, so I'll have to go back to try to fix that again in the in the gradebook. Okay, and uh, by this evening, I will have office hours out for the TAs. That is completely my fault. I missed a meeting with them yesterday because I was stuck in traffic and uh, they were there waiting for me, ready to ready to go. <laughs> so we're meeting this afternoon and uh, I will post that today with an announcement. Okay, so let's go, I guess. Um, last time, let me start sharing. We were reviewing some conditional probability stuff. Oh, when is the homework due? So the homework goes from Wednesdays to Wednesdays and um, it is, supposed to be due by class, but you actually have until midnight on the day it's due. Okay, so um, just a very quick uh, review of last time we worked out some probabilities, right? And so um, one thing we did was we talked about how you can get the probability that say a random variable x equals some little x out of a joint probability for x and y if you sum out the y's. So this is kind of marginalizing out the y. And this guy gets a name marginal probability because I said it last time, but I didn't stop to draw the, the table. But for discrete random variables, you can kind of think of um, as, as values for them maybe tabulated, I don't know, with probabilities inside. And please don't ask me to come up with nine numbers that sum up to one because I can't do that live but there should be nine numbers in there that sum up to one. And if you want the probability that say X equals zero, then you would consider this guy, this guy, and this guy, and you would add them together and you would get a sum in the margin. So that's why we call them marginal probabilities. Okay, so um, the next thing we did last time was we talked about using the definition of conditional probability and unraveling it in order to find an intersecting probability. So specifically, we had the probability that x equals some x and, that's what the comma means, it means and, y equals y, and, where is this? And we could write this as the conditional probability that x equals x given y equals y times the probability that y equals y. That's not the only way we can, we can write it. We can interchange the x and y. But that just comes from the fact that this conditional probability is defined as this intersection over this marginal. So that's a, something we're gonna be using a lot in Markov and we could condition the other way. So this could be the probability that Y equals Y given X equals X times the probability that X equals X. And actually, if I start with a whole bunch of things here, like maybe N random variables as opposed to two, I can condition on sub vectors of that. And we'll get to that eventually and I'll write that down, but you can condition on parts of it and in all different ways. Okay, so um, third out of my four bullet points to review is that uh, if you want a probability for a random variable X, and we are talking about discrete random variables right now, eventually we'll get to continuous ones where we have to bring in probability density functions. Remember, for continuous random variables, a probability like this would always equal zero. There's just too many possibilities and it can't like land on any one particular value with positive probability. But while we're doing discrete stuff, I can put together the previous two bullets here um, because I can write this as this and then, oops, I can write this like this, like using the right-hand side of this. So putting these guys together, I can write this as the sum over all y of the probability x equals x given y equals y 
times the probability that y equals y. And so this thing, this kind of computation is called conditioning on y. And so you might see in a homework problem, compute this, hint, condition on the random variable z. <laughs> That's what it's meaning. It's meaning drag another one in. And finally, the last point of review from last time is you could condition on a random variable to compute something that is already conditional. So if you want the probability that x equals x, given y equals y, and it became convenient somehow because of the information you have in a problem to do this by conditioning on a new random variable z, you can just do exactly what we did above. And the given y equals y just sits there. It just comes along for the ride. So I'm gonna sum over all little z's, the probability that x equals x given z equals z, and the y equals y is still stuck there times the probability that z equals z, and we're still stuck in this universe where we've been given that y equals y. So this is just the previous bullet redone, but starting conditional and conditioning on more stuff. Let's define a Markov chain. We talked about it last time in this kind of short memory thing, but now we're gonna have a formal definition. We're ready to define a Markov chain. And uh, I said last time that you know, sometimes I say process and sometimes I say chain. A process is just something evolving over time and so is a chain, but a chain refers to specifically discrete time. And I also said to you, it's not important. Uh, so if you happen to call something a Markov chain that has continuous time, I don't care. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off with a state space. This is the set of values that the sequence of random variables can take on. So I'm gonna let uh, S, this is like a capital S, be a state space, which I probably should have defined on its own first. But remember, I'm about to write out the definition for a kind of stochastic process, a sequence of random variables. And the assumption is that they all live on the same space. And it's not impossible to make them live on different spaces. So if you had some kind of process where the zeroth one could take on the values one, two, and three, and the next one could take on the values four, five, and six, you could just consider them together on one, two, three, four, five, six, and that a bunch of them have probability zero. So they should really should live on the whole, the same space. Okay, so I've got some kind of space for these guys to live on, and it is um, discrete in this definition. And I'm gonna let Xn be a stochastic process, which is just a sequence of random variables. And it's on this state space S, meaning these random variables take values in there. And we're ready to go with our formal definition. So the process Xn is a Markov chain. I guess chain doesn't need to be capitalized, but I capitalized it. If so it's defined in terms of conditional probability, which is why we spent so much time on that already. I guess not that much time, but the probability that x at time n plus one equals some value j, given the entire past history of the chain. So I'm gonna use some very specific subscripts in here for a reason that hopefully will become apparent soon. But I'm gonna say given that x at time n is i, and then, x at time n minus one all the way down to zero, I'm gonna use i n minus one because you know I can't give these distinct letters because I have this variable number. I very specifically used an i over here and a j over here rather than an i sub n and an i sub n plus one. It would be fine to do that, but um, later today I'll tell you why I didn't do that. It's just kind of convenient to think about it this way. And so I didn't finish the property, but this has to equal the probability that x n plus one is j given just the last value. So the previous history doesn't matter. And it's not saying that uh, x n plus one is independent of these, but it is independent once this is given. So we say that we say that, I should stop writing, so I have to erase and use a pointer. Okay, so we say that this random variable, it's not independent of these, but it's conditionally independent once this is given. And um, 
grad students will see that on the grad problem on the current homework, there's a problem about condition, um, conditional independence. Okay, this, um, as I think I said, is called the Markov property. And so I'll be writing MP a lot in this course, and that, I'm not gonna write it, I'm lazy, but that stands for Markov property. So if you ever see me doing some computation and I have an equal sign and I do something else and I write MP, that's because I've just used this Markov property. <laughs> all right, and oh, by the way, this has to hold for all N. So this is for all N uh, greater than or equal to zero integers. And for all I zero, I one, up to I N minus one, I and J, in the state space. We have defined a Markov chain. It is on a, it, it is discrete time. That's why I use the word chain. And this one happens to be on a discrete state space. And I mentioned last time that we're gonna consider all, or bleh, all four possibilities eventually. Discrete time, discrete space, discrete time, continuous space, etc. But we're gonna spend quite a while in this regime. So if I forget to say it, I mean, it should just be your default right now when we're talking about Markov chains. Discrete, discrete. So the Markov property is saying a little bit more than what I've written here. It, you don't actually, if you're trying to find a probability at time n plus one, you don't actually need what's going on at time n. You just need the last observed time step. So asterisk here. Actually only the last observed time step matters. And I'll write out exactly what I mean by this. Oops, I'm just gonna write observation matters. So as an example, uh, suppose that I want the probability that say X3 is one, given that X1 is five and X0 is two, so you'll see that I skipped I skipped time steps. I don't have x2 in here, but this is still gonna be equal to the probability that x3 is one given the last piece of information that x1 is five. So this comes from the uh, Markov property. In fact, this is equivalent. It's, it's an if and only if kind of thing. And um, the reason this is true, so I'll, let's prove it. I'm putting quotes because this is sort of, I don't know, it's, it's stretching it to call it a proof. We're just gonna show this property. So I'm gonna start with the left-hand side. So that's what my LHS is, left-hand side. Um, and if I write this down, um, I would like to know what two is so that I can use the straight up Markov property as we know it. So I'm gonna condition on the value at time two. So I'm gonna sum over all I in the state space the probability that x3 is one given x2 is i, x1 is five, x0 is two times the probability that x2 is i given x1 is five and x0 is two. So that's that conditioning on a random variable trick but already living in a, in a conditional world. And then I can get rid of some of this past history for the first probability. I don't need this or this anymore by the Markov property. And for the second probability, I don't need this one by the Markov property. And so we get what we get. <laughs> so this is the sum over all I in the state space. The probability X3 is one given X2 is I times the rest of it, the probability x2 is i given x1 is five. So that is this uh, left-hand side. It's not the right-hand side. And I think rather than um, try to manipulate this into the right-hand side, the easiest way to finish showing this is to start with the right-hand side and just say, hey, I get the same thing. So by RHS, I mean this right-hand side up here. And I am also gonna condition on the value at time two. So I'm gonna sum over all I in the state space. 
the probability that x3 is 1 given x2 is i and x1 is 5 times the probability x2 is i given x1 is 5. And so by the Markov property and for the first probability, I'm trying to find a probability for x3 and knowing x2 is enough so I can drop this by the Markov property. And now we have exactly the same thing. We've got the sum over i, the probability, I mean, really, I should just draw an arrow to the line above. So we got um, both of these, oops, sorry. The original right-hand side is now down here. The original left-hand side is now here, and we can see that they're equal. So the whole point of that was you don't need the previous time step. You just need the last observed time step or the last given one, the last piece of information you know. Okay, so we're gonna, I guess, uh, go on. Um, the Markov property is, again, this thing up here. It's saying that the conditional probability given a whole history is just kind of a shorter conditional probability. And again, it's not saying that xn plus one is independent of x2, it's just that this dependence is like this lag one thing because xn plus one is dependent on xn and xn is dependent on xn minus one. And so, I am not saying that this random variable is independent of this one, but again, conditionally independent once kind of an intermediate link is fixed. So um, suppose we have a Markov chain with this Markov property. So here is, again, the Markov property. I really should just cut and paste this, shouldn't I? I'm committed now, but next time. I'm gonna go down all the way to X zero. And so this is just supposed to be the conditional probability given that single last value. Okay, so um, this probability on the right may or may not depend on N, the time. So moving forward, just checking, I'm not really watching the chat today. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so moving forward as you evolve over time, I was saying that where you go next for the next time step only depends on where you are and some random input. Um, like if you're taking a random walk around this space where you move up one with probability P and down one with probability one minus P, then you really don't care where you were before. But it is possible that the probability can also depend on the time step. Oops, I erased. That's actually going to be pretty rare in this course and pretty rare in, not rare, but the default belief is that if you have a Markov chain, this does not depend on n. And if that's true, we call it a time homogeneous Markov chain. And we'll see a couple of not time homogeneous Markov chains, but they're gonna be few and far between. And I'll just really emphasize that when we do. So your default should be that it's always time homogeneous. That is that um, just like the random walk I was describing, I'm gonna go up with probability P and down with some other probability one minus P, and that's not gonna be changing over time. Like I could say, at time n, I go up with some probability p sub n and down with some probability one minus p sub n. And that would be something that would depend on time, but I'm not doing that. Ah, I got a question. How big are the chains in this class going to get? State space wise, I'm assuming, or um, dimensionality. We're gonna see large chains in both, um, in both settings. So we're gonna have some, at least examples of 30,000 dimensional Markov chains. 
Uh, so that means that each one of these random variables actually is 30,000 dimensional. And then the state spaces could also be pretty wild. Uh, we're not gonna do a lot with that because we're just trying to learn kind of basic concepts, but we will see how we can apply it to bigger problems. So if you are at state four, so this is a height of three and this is a height of four, in my simple random walk, uh, probabilities were the same for going up and down, but they don't have to be. So starting at three, I could end up here with some probability, maybe call it P3, and the rest of the probability one minus P3 of ending up here. And <laughs> my four is not in the right space. Let me just get this out of the way. Starting at state six, I, in this particular example where I'm only allowed to go up and down by one because we're not gonna be restricted to that, I might go down to state five with some probability P6 and up to state seven with some probability one minus P6. So it could depend on what state I'm in. Yeah, so if it's not time homogeneous, then um, these guys could actually be like dependent on N, but that's gonna be pretty rare in this class. So assume time homogeneity, I will definitely come out and tell you if it's something different. But again, to answer the other question, again, um, wherever you go is not independent of like where you were before. It definitely depends on where you were before. Let me do some examples. I think I can clear this up if there's anything left to clear up. Okay, so if we have a Markov chain, so I guess I'm doing two abbreviations, MP for Markov property and MC for Markov chain. And wow, that's some pretty bad, bad lag in my drawing. I need to look up sometimes because I'm explaining and I'm drawing circles on things and this and this, and you're not seeing them until, I don't know, 30 seconds later, that's not good. So I'm using MP for Markov property and MC for Markov chain. And so we're gonna assume a time homogeneous Markov chain and we are assuming everything is discrete, although sometimes I'll write um, DTMC and a lot of people, this is a really common acronym and it stands for discrete time Markov chain. But um, if we have a time homogeneous chain, then the one step, oops, one step transition probability of going from time n to time n plus one we just said that our assumption is that this does not depend on time n. And so this is called a, as I just said, a one step transition probability. And we're gonna denote it by a lowercase p, oops. That's why I tried to make it small. So you can't even read it, but oh wow, it's really lagging. A lowercase p sub ij. That's a lowercase p. I'll just draw a, actually, I'll write this probability over here so you can see a capital P. This is the probability that we move from i to j in any one step at any time. If you're reading Durrett, the one of the two books I recommended, I believe he writes this, which is also fine. But being consistent with something I said last time, I'm going to reserve, like I'm going to move from subscripts to parentheses when I'm moving into a continuous state space. Uh, I don't care what you use. Uh, I will understand what you mean when grading your stuff. <laughs> okay, so what do we need to know? Um, so just to emphasize, the probability of going from i to j is the probability that x1 is j given x0 is i, but it's also the probability that x11 is j given x10 is i, because it's time homogeneous. Okay, so we're gonna collect these transition probabilities in a matrix, and we're gonna call it, wait for it, a transition probability matrix. Uh, people, myself included, often say probability transition matrix. It's, you know, it's, you have to stop and dissect the English language. It doesn't really matter. 
but it's a matrix full of transition probabilities. So um, we're going to arrange the transition probabilities into a transition probability matrix. And we're going to denote this with a capital kind of double lined P. So we're going to call it uh, a double lined P. And uh, we're assuming still a discrete state space. And this is going to be state space dependent. So remember, we used an S for our state space. So maybe our Markov chain lives on 0, 1, and 2. Markov people, which I am one, always start everything from 0. It makes counting difficult in real life. You're always, you're always giving a total one less than what you have. Um, so if we had a state space like this, I would make a little matrix. And I would write, you don't have to write these uh, column and row headings. And inside here, I get the probability of going from 0 to 0, the probability of going from 0 to 1, et cetera. And we also may have uh, infinite matrices. So don't be surprised if you see something with a state space on non-negative integers where we just have kind of some dot, dot, dot action, you know, and just fill in some entries. So one property that this matrix has to have is that the entries in any given row have to sum up to one. Because if, if you consider, say, row one, which is not the first row, my first row is row zero in this case, we have the probability of going from one to zero, the probability of staying at one, which is like, oh, I'm circling these probability of going from one to one, which is staying at one, and the probability of going from one to two, which I already circled, oh. Maybe I'll try, a, I have an idea what to do next time to maybe cut out some of this lag. But the rows have to sum to one, because starting from state one, you go somewhere, even if it means you're staying at state one. So the rows, sum to one. And so we're going to write like pij summed over all j in the state space must be one for all i in the state space. When, when this happens, we call it in general, even outside of Markov chains, a stochastic matrix. And it's possible that the columns sum to one as well, but they definitely don't have to. And if the columns sum to one as well, it's called a doubly stochastic matrix. And it will eventually write that down later when we need one. But in general, the columns don't have to sum to anything interesting. OK, so a probability transition matrix or a transition probability matrix or a stochastic matrix, definitely the rows sum to one. Let's look at an example. and. Um, we're going to have cases where you want to show something as a Markov chain, like in your first homework assignment. But this is not one of them. Here I'm assuming a Markov chain. So I'm going to let xn be the quality of an item coming off of an assembly line. And I'm going to label them good or defective. So, And so I'm going to let uh, xn be 1. Let's do this piecewise. If the nth item is good and zero if it's defective. Um, there's no reason to believe that this, <laughs> this has to be a Markov chain, but I am making the assumption it is. So suppose, assume that Xn is a Markov chain governed by, so I'm going to give a particular transition matrix. OK, so I'm going to have probabilities, a two by two matrix. And I'm just making some stuff up here. So across the top, I'm going to do 0.88 and 0.12. So they add up to 1. And across the bottom, 0 0.01 and 0 0.99, which at least you can hear it. Maybe you already wrote that down. OK, so there's no why is this a Markov chain. I don't really think it actually is. Probably, well, it depends on what causes the defects, but probably they're going to come in bunches based on material or machine being not calibrated. Um, 
So given this, I just wanted to us to go through a few quick questions. Um, so the first is going to be, what is the probability that x1 is 0 given x0 is 1? This is just read off the matrix. So this is one time step from time 0 to time 1. And we're going from state 1 to state 0, which is going to be right here. I know I'm insulting you, but we're going to build up to something more interesting. So this is just read it off the matrix. Uh, next up, what is the probability that x at time 48 is 0 given x at time 47 is 1? Same thing. It's still one time step. So it is the 1, 0 entry of the matrix. Too cool, right? All right. Um, what is the probability that x at time 48 is 0 given x at time 47 is 1 and x at time 30 is 9 by the Markov property. I don't care about that earlier time step. This is the probability that x at time 48 is 0 given x at time 47 is 1. OK, so let's do something maybe a little more interesting than these. This was just making sure you knew the definition of things and the Markov property. So for my deeth, ABC deeth trick, I have a three-way joint probability. So let's find the probability that x0 is 1 and comma x1 is 0 and comma x2 is 1. OK, so here I want a joint probability that x0 is 1, x1 is 0, x2 is 1. And the fact of the matter is I can't tell you the answer right now <laughs> because Markov chains and transition probability matrix only matrices, they tell us about the transitions, not where we start. So to answer this, we need what is called an initial distribution. We need to figure out how we're going to start the chain. We're going to start at state 1 with some probability or state 0 with some probability. So we need what is known as an initial for the chain. So I'm going to let this lowercase p0 be the probability that x0 is 0 and p1 be the probability that x0 is 1. And in this case, this is just 1 minus p0. And now we can answer this question. OK, so um, let's do it. We've got the probability that x0 is 1, x1 is 0, x2 is 1. And I know this isn't review stuff. This is Markov stuff. But some of you might be bored here. We will pick it up. Well, I want everyone to have the solid foundation before things start going faster. OK, so I can condition on, um, I can, let's see, I want to turn things around. So there's many ways to do this, but one that I think will be useful is to say this is the probability that x2 is 1, given the rest of it, x1 is 0, x0 is 1, times the probability of the rest of it, x1 is 0, x0 is 1. And then I can compute that final uh, joint probability there by conditioning again. Or actually, I'm not conditioning on anything. I'm just rewriting it. So I get x2 is 1 given x1 is 0. x0 is 1, which we're going to drop from the Markov property. And then x1 is 0 given x0 is, is 1 times the probability x0 is 1. And by the Markov property for the first probability, I don't need this one. And so what is left here is, I'll recopy that matrix in a second. Um, I'm transitioning in one time step from 0 to 1. So that is a piece of 0, 1. And then I'm transitioning in one time step from 1 to 0. So multiply by a p, 1, 0. And then I'm starting at state 1, which is probability p, 1. So 
by multiplying numbers. And this is why when people talk about Markov chains, you hear them say independent transitions. It's not that Xn is independent of Xn plus one or before, but the transitions are independent and we get to multiply probability. D, okay, so again, people always say independent transitions. And I just underline that. Hands up. I feel like I'm like a dealer at some table in a casino. See, I'm not writing now. Okay, E, and the longest example ever. Um, let's find the probability that X1 is one. And I better put my matrix down here again. So you look at that and you say, oh, I don't know probabilities. I only know transitions, but oh, what was the answer? The answer was, if I'm answering the right question, P0 and P1 just have to be given as some kind of way to start your chain and they have nothing to do with the actual chain or the matrix. So P01 is the probability of going from zero to one. And this is 0.12, it really, would have helped if I wrote these out. So back here, when I'm multiplying these three probabilities, this is 0.12. And then P10 is the probability you go from one to zero and you can grab that out of the matrix and it's 0 0.01. And then P1 had to be given, which I haven't given the initial distribution numerically. All right, so let me use it. Let's just find the probability that X1 is, is one. And as I was saying, this does not involve transitions, but it's also not the initial distribution, which is given for the probability for X0 to take on various values. But we can condition on X0. So this is the probability that X1 is one given X0 is zero. Note to self, never do our first example again with zeros and ones for the type steps, zeros and ones. Plus the probability that X1 is one, given that X0 is one, times the probability that X0 is one. <laughs> okay, so the very first probability up there, I'm moving from state zero to state one. And so I get a P one zero. And oh, and I have a number, but I'm gonna write in the next line. So I'll start my next line, even though I haven't finished this line. This is point zero one. And then I'm gonna multiply by the probability that X zero is zero. And this is some given initial probability, which I never actually gave. And then adding to that, I wanna go from one to one. So P11, which in my matrix is 0.99. And then the initial probability that we started at one, we're calling this P1 or one minus P0. Okay, I think um, if, if that makes sense now, um, I have one more part in this really long example. I'm gonna call it part F. <laughs> because that's where we are. And this is what someone brought up before. I didn't, I didn't catch the name, but um, a two-step transition probability. So what is the probability that X2 is one given that X0 zero is zero? Okay, so to do this two-step transition probability, um, you know how to do this. Formally, you would condition on where you are at time one. Um, and informally, I'm just gonna say that this happens when we go from zero to zero to one, or we go from zero to one to one. I'm just conditioning on where I am at X at time one, but I'm doing it informally now. And these are disjoint events. You can't see this and also see this. And so, or in probability, when you have disjoint events, you get to add, add things up. So again, you can do this formally, but I'm not. Um, 
So this is the probability I go from zero to zero, P00, times the probability I go from zero to one, plus the probability I go from zero to one, probability one to one. And one more time, if you want to write that out formally, you take this upper left circled thing and you condition on the value of x1. But as at least one of you and probably more have already noticed, something like this looks like matrix multiplication. And it is. So this is the 0, 1 entry of the probability transition matrix squared. Because if you think about what we have, we've got P00, P01, P10, P11. Thinking maybe when I put up the recording of the video, I'll just, I'll just stagger the audio a little bit. But then all of these conversations make no sense. P00, P01, blah, blah, blah. And so if you multiply these out, um, you, if you take this row times this column, uh, that's what you get up here. And in matrix multiplication, that's what would be up here. OK, so um, we can formally show this, but um, the I'm just going to state it. The probability of moving from Oops. Oh, shoot. I thought it was 250. I am so, so sorry. I will give you back time in the next class. I am so sorry. Go away. Bye.